I've got so much that I want to accomplish and I feel like it, it never happens fast enough. So then I, I go, I go hard and I, I schedule stuff tighter together, but then it almost feels like it's counterproductive because now I'm, I'm trying to squeeze too much in. What's up, everybody? Welcome to Solid. I'm Jeff Fieldstead, and I'm here with my co-host, Brandon Neal. And we're excited. We're going to have a conversation today with a good friend of mine, Jefferson Rogers, who's the CEO of JKR Windows and built an incredible business over the last few years, right? Yes, sir. I'd like to think so. Yeah, awesome, man. Well, I'm proud of you, dude. I'm, I'm excited you're here. Thanks, brother. Appreciate you guys having me on. You bet. You bet. Well, we got a few things we want to talk about today. I think, uh, you know, first of all, let's let everybody get to know you a little bit. You've, um, we've known each other since we were young kids. I think, what, 15 or younger, something like that, yep, right? I think uh, you were 13, I was 14. Yeah. You're a little bit older. You always be older. Just a, just a <laughs> tiny bit. <laughs> it's funny. But um, so we've known each other since we were young. And then, so how long ago did you start your company? 2018, March 22nd. Okay. 2018. Which is about four years ago now. Huh? Just over four years. Okay, cool. Sounds good. So you started your company and what do you think you'll do this year in revenue? Uh, we're on track to do right around 17, 18 million. Okay. Awesome. But we're really ramping up on recruiting. So, I mean, we're shooting for 20 million. Awesome. So from zero to 20 million inside of 48 months. Yeah. That's awesome. So to most people, it looks like overnight success, right? It is, man. <laughs> Just overnight. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Only four years. <laughs> yeah. But it wasn't always, right? You, you weren't always winning at a high level. I think let's go back. Let's talk about how did it all start, man? How did you get to this place? You're, you're winning, but the drive came from somewhere. Where did it all start? Yeah, shoot. It, it was not always like this because when we met, when we were kids, I had just started smoking weed and I started a pretty long career of smoking weed at that point. <laughs> at 14? <laughs> at 14 was the first time I smoked weed. You had a lot of experience with that. A lot of experience, yeah. And I remember the first time I smoked because it was uh, the, I don't know if I can drop names because this is a small community here, but it was the, the owner of a local skate shop and he had a vert ramp in his backyard with a little shed under one edge of the vert ramp. And inside of that little shed, they had a little like smoke place where me and my buddy went in there and got his dad's bong out. And took his dad's? His dad's. Oh, I think it was his dad's. He's like, <laughs> this is my dad's stash. With some. What year was this? So that was, uh, let's see, I was 14, and that would have been 98. Okay. 1998. Dang. So, yeah, I, for a long time, I was just partying. I had no goals. I had nobody around me that was making goals or talking about goals or ambitions or anything. So I was just kind of drifting around for a lot of years. And then I had a conversation. There was a couple of conversations, lots of seeds that were planted along the way you were maybe one of my first examples of somebody who had some goals and was talking about some things that they wanted to do with their life about being a marine biologist and going to travel in the world and scuba diving in the bahamas and it was like holy shit this guy i didn't that's know fu but wait, that's funny you remember that marine biologist marine I dude if i could this. do anything to be on the beach in the, in water. the water how old were you in you the bahamas this, goal? this was like yeah was probably like 15 yeah. 16 oh years really old. yeah all right yeah i've been a dreamer since day one man <laughs> <laughs> so that that that's cool though that's a cool story you remember so yeah that, i do yeah. remember that because i i didn't have very many people in my life that were talking like that yeah about things that didn't even seem possible but you saw it clear as day that it, this was a dream of yours that you wanted to happen so you know i i never got around to making any of those dreams until much much later and i had a conversation with my uncle one point and when i had moved away and i was just getting clean and he asked me just a couple of questions that uncles do, like, you know, when are you going to start, start taking things seriously? And do you see yourself getting married? And I remember that conversation because it was after that, that I really had started thinking about like, how do I get my shit together? I got to start taking this seriously. I got to start so doing something. So was this something. your uncle Ben? No, this was, was a different uh, uncle. It was my uncle. He was a police officer in Mesa, Arizona. Okay. And he was always a, a mentor of mine and really not all that emotionally available compared to, you know, maybe 
how I've become as a father and an uncle to my nieces and nephews. But he was, he, I knew that he loved me. He just wasn't like a, a huge communicator. So when he did talk, I was like intently listening. I took it seriously. And, and a lot of those conversations that I have with him stuck more than most any of my other family members because of that relationship that we had. Wow. It's awesome. So yeah, man, it was, uh, it was slow going for me to start getting things going, but it was, you know, just little seeds that were planted along the way and, and people that cared about me and that were impressing some of the importance of getting my stuff together and taking life seriously and making goals. And it just took me a long time to implement any of it. Yeah. Just, just took a minute to make the decision. Mm -hmm. So do you feel like you always had the motivation to build a business? Do you feel like you were always an entrepreneur and, and, 100 yeah. percent i i didn't know where it was coming from during those years when I, I struggled i never got one job that i applied for and every time that i would sit down for interviews i just had this gut ache like these people are the, the way that they make you feel like you get to prove yourself to them when i know that like these people sitting across from me aren't shit. yeah they're they're just in a management position and they got this this authority position so they feel like they can talk down to you and that just made me sick so all the jobs that I ever had, I had gotten recommended because of my work ethic and the, the person that I was. And, and I always did well. But then as soon as I was confronted with any authority, <laughs> I couldn't help myself, man. I got fired from every job that I had, too. Yeah. I think that so, might be a big key because uh, watching you today, I mean, I've, I haven't known you as long as Jeff's known you, but I've known you for quite a while. And uh, I think one of the strengths you have from, from looking from the outside is – you don't see anybody as superior to you. You see yourself as an equal to them. Mm -hmm. And that's probably why it drove you so crazy. I would imagine when you, uh, did. when they were inferior, when they made you feel inferior. And I, I mean, it's not like I was lacking respect for people. If somebody sure. earned my respect, I loved working for people like that. But then as soon as somebody stepped in that they felt like they could just talk down to you and put their thumb on you and, and make you do what they wanted you to do just because of that position. Oh man, it just drove me insane. Yeah, it's like they're trying to get you in this begging and persuading mode, right? I've always felt like employers. Mm -hmm. I just tell people in our business, when we as as we're looking for great recruiters or teaching people to uh, develop great leaders, is look, we're not in the begging, persuading, convincing business, right? We're in, we're looking for developing leaders, and I feel like a lot of leaders kind of have that rebellion towards authority. I don't know, Brandon, did you ever have that? You ever have a rebellion towards authority? <sighs> Um, not until later in life. I was actually, my, my parents were always, uh, well, my dad always an employee mindset, but still, I mean, he's worked for the power company. He was a lineman for forever. And I think, uh, for the most part, I, I, I saw myself as just being the hardest working guy on the job for somebody else. And I don't think I started to recognize the importance of being an entrepreneur and being the leader until probably later in life when I got involved in Primerica where they were always talking about corporate America mm -hmm. and learning how corporate America really operated. Absolutely. And then I went, okay, I'm not going to fall into that trap of being an employee and working for somebody else, you know? And, and then I, I kind of got that edge, I think where I go, okay, now, now, you know, I don't want to say jobs are bad, but for the most part, I think jobs are bad now. It's actually a, yeah, I know, would say it, rather than a job being bad, maybe the system that allows people to go get a job isn't going to allow you to achieve your dreams if you really want to do something big, right? right. Cuz you I mean your daughter has a job and you're glad she does, right? Yeah, <laughs> I, I think it's important. Be a, yeah, I think it's, it's important to learn. Yeah. Yeah, I think the system of it though thinking, "Oh, I'm going to do something big with my life at a job is just not going to happen," right? Correct. I, mean, I remember one of my mentors told me some, one time he said, "Jeff, why you get mad your pay got cut?" And I go, "What are you talking about? Man, they cut my pay." And he goes, well, what's a company supposed to do? And I'm like, well, make profits. He goes, so why do you get mad at a company for doing what they're supposed to do? Right. Mm -hmm. you guys, right. You're just in the wrong position. Right? Exactly. So yeah, that's the same, same type of realization that I'd come to. It's, I'd always been a, a hard worker and I'd learned attention to detail and, and quality from my dad and growing up in construction and, you know, measure twice, cut once and make sure that you only, you take your time. Cause I would get so ahead of myself. I would go do something fast and then have to redo it again. And my dad learning those hard lessons from my dad, it was really hard nose in the way that he taught and coached. And then later on realizing that this is a pattern for me, it's like authority. I have a hard time with authority, especially authority that wants to treat you like shit. Yeah. And then Primerica was a, one of my first 
real exposures to that, that type of environment and the sales culture and personal development and talking about what the, that system is designed to do and hearing, you know, some, some great people talk about it and just kind of change a perspective and a new, new awareness was like, yeah, I mean, I should be doing this myself. I'm always the hardest working guy. Why not do it for myself? Right. And it still took me a while to get there, but it was those, like those little seeds that were planted along the way that kind of helped you get to the next level little by little. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, knowing you for so long, I, f- I feel like you've always kind of had that entrepreneurial kind of, uh, perspective, you know, not loving authority. I think most entrepreneurs don't want someone telling them what to do. You know, I think Brandon's unique because probably you're a little bit more logical than most people. You're very structured in your personality, mm-hmm. right? Where I think Jefferson, you and I are more emotional about it and mm-hmm. balls to the wall and <laughs> just go bit. for it, right? <coughs> a little bit. Yeah. So, so you, so you had these influences along the way. And if, if, if I'm, Right. I think that you're really struggling at life. And at some point in your life, you just said, you know what? Enough's enough. I'm going to change this. Mm -hmm. What, I mean, I don't know how much of that you want to talk about or what, but what was it leading up to that point? And then maybe talk about the, the, the time you made a decision to say, you know what, I'm going to go change my life. Because the thing I really respect about you, dude, is you haven't just started a business and become successful, but you made a decision to become a great man, you know, and I think the world needs more of that today. Brandon and I have been talking about it a lot today that so few people in America today have decided to become great men, which impacts society as a whole, right? Raising Mm -hmm. great men in the next generation. So I've watched you do that. So I think going back to that decision where you said, you know what, enough's enough. I'm going to go change my life. What, what was it that led up to that decision? And then kind of what were your feelings, your thoughts through that decision? And then why windows? How'd you end up doing that? Yeah, it was, I mean, it could have been anything. It was just the right message at the right time from the right person for, for me to get into windows, for me to make those changes in my life with my addiction and, and some of the stuff that was holding me back. So I got involved in windows from, a guy that I'd known from getting involved with Primerica. We said that, you know, someday we're going to go into business together. I don't know what it's going to be, but I've loved working with you and we'll find something that we can do together one day. And then he shows up at my house. I was renting a house and he brought this window over and he's selling windows. It's like this guy that had built this incredible financial services business and he was a real estate investor all of a sudden is working for a window company. So I was like really confusing to me at first. Then he showed me this sample window and I still need to show you guys a sample window. It's incredible. So when we go into a house, we bring this full size sample. It looks like a a massage table that you're bringing in. And then you can show them all the benefits and the features and all the bells and whistles that most people don't even know exist. Right. So the first time I saw that, then it started making a little bit more sense. It's like, man, I could really see myself selling that thing as as good as he explained it. And as excited as I got, I I was a renter, never owned a house. But I got excited about windows. So that was, that was another seed that was planted. It was like, man, if this guy can do it, and if he's taking time away from these other big, huge business opportunities that he's had to go focus on building a window business, he must see an incredible opportunity here. So that led me into the window business. And then years after that, I'd, during all these years, I had a drinking problem. And it got even worse when I started hanging out with Brian because he drank whiskey every night. <laughs> so then... I was not only drinking beer, but I was starting to justify drinking the hard stuff too. And it came to a kind of a really low, low point in September of 2017. And I I got in a fight with my wife. I got in a fight at a concert. I knocked this kid out and I drove away in my vehicle, drunker than maybe I'd ever been before. And it was just like a really, really low point because I got the car impounded. And the next morning was my son's 12th birthday party. And we were supposed to be taking all the kids to the birthday party in that car. Dang. So not only did I get the car impounded, but I was so hung over that I, I couldn't even help contribute to the birthday party. We had to Uber all the kids over there. And then I, I laid on the bench, just miserable and kind of half in and out of consciousness, feeling pretty ashamed of what I had done and the example that I was being for my whole family was there. I mean, brothers, nieces, nephews, my mom. So that was like that, that rock bottom, you know, luckily I didn't go to jail. I didn't kill anybody or anything like that, but it was enough for me. Another seed planted that was like, I I can't keep doing this. This is not the example that I want to be for my family. 
two months later, I, I was listening to, uh, I was supposed to be out knocking doors, but I was scrolling through Facebook in my car out in the area. And I saw this commercial come across for Grant Cardone's 10 X growth conference. And he was doing an ambassador program or a, like a mentoring program that was leading up to that, that event in February of 2018. And this was November of 2017. So I had, uh, I just kind of had this feeling like, man, I've been hearing about this Grant Cardone guy. He's doing this mentor program and he's saying that he's going to personally mentor a hundred people. And I think this could be the answer to me kind of getting out of this cycle and all these patterns that I've been in and his story of overcoming addiction was kind of what helped me believe that it was possible for me. And two months later, after joining that mentor program, I, I quit drinking and smoking pot on the same day. So I've been sober since January 8th, 2018. And then two months after that, I started my business. And, uh, in that first year in eight months, we did a million dollars in, in sales. Amazing. Great job. How did that feel? How did that feel? Felt phenomenal, man. I mean, I'd been clear headed for the first time. So it was like, man, I knew I was capable of doing some shit like this. If I could just get rid of all those so, substances. So you, yeah. you just quit. Cold turkey. That was it. Yep. Did you have any help along the way to help you quit? Was it just a decision? It's time had, for me to move on. What, what, what helped you stay the course? You know, I went to a, I went to an AA meeting one time with my stepdad. I was, I think I was 17 and I was 18 and it was like the most miserable, dreary fucking place that I'd ever been. And I, I told myself I would never go back to an event like that. So much negativity and all these sob stories. And it was just like this most negative experience. So then it was like, well, shit, how am I going to quit? If I'm, I've already vowed that I would never go back to one of those things. I'm not sure how I'm going to get help. So it took me a long time to do it, but it was just me kind of building on my belief that it was, it was not aligned with who I am and who I was meant to be and the example that I want to be for my family, my wife and kids. Yeah. I think that's a good point right there that I, I feel like you're never going to outperform your belief levels. You're never going to, you're never going to do something you don't see yourself as mm -hmm. right. So if you don't see yourself as becoming successful, you're never going to become successful. You've got to see yourself clean. You've got to see yourself performing at high levels. You got to see yourself winning. You got to see yourself wanting to be in a positive environment mm -hmm. in order to achieve that. So you, you, you feel like you've had that for a long time. Do you, do you, let me ask you this. Do you feel like maybe the substance was almost like whatever substance it was, whether it was alcohol or smoking weed or whatever it was that you were doing throughout those years, do you think maybe you're trying to suppress your motivation? Do you, do you feel oh, like? Oh, 100%, man. When I've, I've gone back and reflected on all those years and, and like where it came from, it's like, I don't know why I did it. It was, I could have very well hung out with all of the, the jocks and all, I was friends with all those kids too, but I chose to go this way. Yeah. And I, when I look back at like 13, 14 years old, I smoked my first cigarette when I was 13. I started drinking beer and smoking pot when I was 14. And I started hanging out with this other group of people. And basically what it was doing was helping me suppress the responsibility that was heavy on me of my dad was a, a Las Vegas firefighter and he was like the, a calendar model and he's this big badass. Like the, the, he's like a man. He man, is a man's right? man. Yeah. Now, and that's, I'm named after him. And yeah. it was like this huge responsibility to live up to the name of Jefferson Rogers and this badass image of this firefighter carrying an ax on the freaking cover of the firefighter magazine. Yeah. And, and then also being the oldest of four boys and being the example to my brothers. And I led them all down the wrong path for a long time. Mm. And I suppressed all the responsibility of living up to that potential and the ultimate version of myself and, and the expectations of my parents. And then, uh, you know, finally just wore me out and I, I knew it wasn't who I was. And it was always, I always felt this tension about those, those things that I was doing and, and the alignment. And so I did see myself being clean and being that example and being successful. And it just had to get so far down that road that I was, I was literally just so sick and tired of repeating these same patterns and doing it and justifying it and making excuses. Enough's that enough. Enough was enough, man. You were ready. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, until somebody's ready, they can do all the AA meetings or whatever, but until they're ready and they're at that point in their life where they, like you're saying, Jeff, see themselves as getting past that and beyond that. 
I don't think it can happen. Yeah. Yeah, I think a lot of people see themselves as victims. I mean, in situation like it's it is inspiring to hear your story. I think especially a lot of people are going to hear this, but um a lot of times when people are struggling, whether it's with substance or maybe an environment issue, maybe they got a negative environment in their household or whatever, they see themselves as a victim instead of, hey, I have the ability to change. Right? I'm not a tree. I'm not stuck here. I can get up and change. I can change my circumstances, change the way I think, change the actions. And then obviously it's going to change the result. You know, mm-hmm. so many people are just it's 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 like if they could realize that it's the way you see yourself that keeps you in that situation and anybody has the right to change the way they see themselves right so so you you find Grant Cardone this guy changed your life you feel like you could relate to him he was Grant we all know Grant Cardone's really open with his struggles that he's had in the past mm-hmm. super motivated what was it about Grant Cardone was it what he was doing was it you just felt like you could relate to his past. What was it about him that maybe attracted you to him? You know what? I think it's Brandon mentioned it earlier. I've just got like this, this sense that people aren't better than me. They're just a little further down the path and they have more experience than me. So when I'm seeing Grant Cardone, the way that he talks and the way that he treats people, I mean, the guy is not anything that special, right? He's just been doing it for a long time and he's got great work ethic and he's been consistent for years and years and years and years pushing and improving and developing a team and developing his communication skills. And so, you know, I, I do it a lot. I don't, I always tell people not to compare themselves to other people, but I think it's, it's kind of been healthy for me. Yeah. I think com- comparing. Yeah. I, I mean, we are, we always say compete, don't compare, mm-hmm. but I think it's sometimes, I mean, if you want to be like somebody, right, if you want their life, there's nothing wrong with comparing yourself and saying, all right, what could I change? Right. What can I improve in my life to become more like this person who inspires me? You know, I, I don't think there's anything wrong well, with isn't, that. Isn't competing comparing in a way? Yeah. I, I mean, mean, you're kind of comparing and I, I, you know, that's why that's, that is competition. It's a good point. Yeah. You know? And so I, I, I would always hear that and I was confused. Like, what do you mean compete? Don't compare. I mean, you know, I, I get what they're saying, right? Yeah. Like you're saying, Grant Cardone's no better than anybody else, but he's further down the road. He's put more work ethic in, he's put more time in. And when that happens to any one of us, we're going to get similar results. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no doubt. You know, no it's doubt not, not it. a talent thing. I mean, that, that's, I'm definitely not the most talented guy, but I know how to focus and I know how to work hard. Mm-hmm. And if I can do those two things better than most, you're going to win. win. I'll yep. win. Exactly. Yeah. You don't even have to do it better than most because almost rarely nobody does it. Yeah. No. Right. <laughs> I mean, it's, it is not very tough to, to, to beat everybody. Yeah, it really yeah. isn't. It's got to be consistent. And I think yeah. the, the issue is I, 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 I always train on this, but it never takes as long as you think it's going to take, but it takes longer than most people will put forth the effort. Mm-hmm. If that no makes doubt sense, about right? it. So um, it usually happens pretty dang quick, but there's, and, and there's some effort, but I think a lot of people way overestimate the effort it's going to take. It's going to take some effort, yep. but the time frame it's going to happen in is, and, and you're, yeah. look at you, four years in, $20 million company. Yeah, some of my original goals were, I mean, I just wanted to beat that other company that I came from. I never, never back in those days envisioned our business even getting to $10 million. It was just, man, I had a, had a vision for building this company and, and building it different and having something that we could be proud of and we could stand for that was going to separate us from these other companies. And then it, it helped me attract a ton of people. And then that the vision just kept evolving and kept evolving. And some of these big goals that I was making to do 5 million in sales, that was more than that other company had ever done in the four years I was working for them. So I thought maybe it'll take me four or five years to get to 5 million. But you know, we had, we got to 5 million quick. I think something you said earlier, Jefferson, was you got excited about windows. Yeah. You got excited, right? Mm -hmm. So when you went into business for yourself, I would assume um, there's always some fear involved. Is this going to work? Right. Uh, Can I do this? A lot of uncertainty. Yeah. But how much more of it would you say was excitement in starting your own business, bringing your brothers with you? And is your dad involved with the business too? He was, he's not with us anymore, but for a year and a half, he worked with us too. So all those dynamics had to be a big driving force and going, man, I'm going to do this and we're going to make it work. Almost like, almost like you're not going to let it fail. Yeah. Is that accurate? hundred percent, man. I, there was no, no option for failure because now I had 
my first employee was my mom. I had a couple of door knockers and things like that, but I was trying to convince my mom to come work for me for a year. And she thought I was joking the whole time. I was like, I'm not joking. It's like, I want you to come work for me. You're going to have a better opportunity here in a more positive environment. It's going to be, it's going to be crazy and it's going to be hectic and there's going to be some anxieties and things like that, but it's better than working at that shithole at Wells Fargo with all the negative shit going on over there. So now once I got my mom here, it made it even more real. And the commitment level had to go through the roof because now I'm, I'm supporting my mom. She left this secure company, right? Uh-huh. To go work with her son who's starting out. I started. can't let her down. Yeah. And so after I got my mom, then it was now I'm working on my dad and my brothers. Yeah. And from day one, before it ever even happened, you know, I was trying to build some credibility when I'm sitting there at the kitchen table. I'm telling them this is family business, homegrown. Mom and dad work for me. My brothers are all in the sales department. This was not even true yet, but I, I manifested it all. And then I just went out there and put the work in and proved to them that they could rely on me and we were going to build something special together. And one by one, you know, they all started coming to work. That's like awesome. Family business. So your vision was clear. It was there. You knew what you were going to build mm-hmm. before you ever built it. Yep. Is that true? Yep. Yeah. And, and I you, talked about it every day. Yeah. I, I, I didn't miss a meeting for two years. You dream about it? Dream about it. Wrote it down on my yeah. goals every single day, twice a day. Oh. That was, I've, I've been, eat, I eat, sleep, and breathe this business. And yeah. it's, that's, that's, I mean, that focus that we're talking about, that excitement. If you don't have the focus and excitement and eat, sleep, and breathe your business, you're not going to go very far. Yeah, no, you got to be willing to outwork the next guy, right? Because someone's always looking to take your spot. Mm-hmm. You know, I used to always ask a question. Okay, you think you're focused? Yeah, I'm focused. I'm focused. You have any dreams about winning? No, you ain't focused. Yeah, no. You know, I I would dream about big events, filling up stadiums or filling up, you know, meeting rooms with a bunch of people, big agency, you know, being a regional vice president with a bunch of regional vice presidents in the room before it ever happened. Right. Mm -hmm. So when I'd go to work every day and I'd go do my prospecting or my appointments, that was in my head. That was the, that was the overwhelming feeling when I'd have somebody cancel on me or my best guy quit, you know, it, 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 I don't want to say it didn't affect me, but I always had the next thing Yep. lined up and I knew exactly where I was going. I knew what it looked like more than anything. Mm-hmm. No doubt. I, I see that with JKR. So JKR stands for what? So we've got, uh, I've got three little brothers Yep. and we all have the same initials, JKR. I've even got a tattoo you were giving me shit about the other day on my back. <laughs> <laughs> I got when I was 19. You got uh, a tramp stamp, dude. It's hilarious. Wow. <laughs> really? Before I knew what a tramp stamp was, <laughs> I got a tramp stamp. Because my uncle that gave me the tattoo, he's like, are you sure you don't want to do it on the top of your back? It's like, no, dude, I think it'd look awesome right down here. <laughs> Were you high when you got this? T- yes. <laughs> yes, I was. And I was drinking also. Man. But well. yeah, we've, uh, I, I originally was going to call it Hero Windows. It's kind of a funny story because I, I had Tyson Bowen drop me up some art and we were going to do this cool logo that said hero windows and i had kind of this backstory of where i'd come up with it i loved it i was i was sold that it was going to be hero windows i'd had like a i'd started the filing process for my entity and then i heard this concept from ty lopez and he said do a do a parking lot test whether it's a business name or a business concept or an idea that you have just do go to somebody you don't even know and ask them what they think about it because they're not going to be partial. They're not going to try and be cautious of your feelings or anything. So I went and did this with Hero Windows, and I was excited. I tell them all about it, and then the looks on everyone's faces were like, I don't know, man. Huh. <laughs> and so after like four or five of those experiences, I was like, God, I really like that, but I'm not getting the best responses out of everybody. And then I talked to my mom about it, and she said, well, you had told me that you were thinking about calling it JKR Windows. I was like, yeah, but it's, you know, it's kind of cheesy and it's just going to be me. And I don't know if the boys will ever come work for me. And she's like, no, I think you should call it JKR Windows. Huh? So cool. Just, so you did. Just went for it. That's awesome. So I think too, Jefferson, that just that maybe um, go down another topic along with all of this is you're somebody and, and not everybody has done this the way you've done it, but as, and, and Jeff's already alluded to it, but you've built a successful company the last four years. You've been super focused on that but while doing that you've strengthened your marriage you've built upon your relationship with your daughters and your family life has improved drastically while doing that yeah how does all that kind of 
parallel or because I think sometimes people go, I'm going to go all in in business and then their family life suffers or vice versa. Mm -hmm. Their family life does well, but then their business suffers Mm -hmm. and they have a tough time maybe. And neither of those are success, by the way. Neither of those are success. Yeah, success Mm -hmm. is doing it all. That's Mm -hmm. right. So I'd like to hear your thoughts and comments on that. You've got a lot of great content out there you've been putting out on a lot of these topics. So, you know, I'd like to hear your. Yeah, I think. Grant Cardone impressed upon me early on that you can be good at all of them and success is being good at all these areas of your life. And if you're, you're only good at one of them and one of your other areas is suffering, then it's exactly right. That's not success. So when I, I think, I don't know if you guys were following me back in the early, early days when I was pulsing all the stuff with like a 10 X hat on and I was like, what's up all my 10 X people, (laughs) beautiful day out there. I was out knocking doors and and uh, I started getting everybody reaching out to me. Like I had several people reaching out to me like, what are you doing, man? You're, you only live once. I mean, why are you working so hard? That's all I ever see you doing is working. And it was like, I'd always heard this was going to happen. I was like, fuck, it's happening. <laughs> yeah, They're by doing the way, it. if that doesn't happen, you're never going to win. If people outside aren't saying you're working too hard, you're not going to win. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's so a good it's, sign. it had started happening and they had all of those same justifications. All the things that were keeping them from winning were all of the fears and the doubts that they were trying to vomit on top of me. And so that's when I, I started realizing that those things that I had learned from Grant Cardone about being good at all of these things were so important because I, I had talked to my wife early on and I said, we're going to have to go through some stuff. I mean, I'm going to be focused. I'm like spending tons and tons of time, 18, 20 hour days on this business. I got to do it all right now. So I got to have your buy in and your support if I'm going to be able to do this and do it at a high level, because if I don't have your support here, I'm going to be distracted and there's always going to be something hanging over my head. So we had, we'd communicated that and we were going through these seasons where I would go hard for like two weeks straight. I would, I'd never see my kids, my wife, I'd, and she'd call me and I'd get all irritated with her. I was like, God, I'm right in the middle of something. Every time you call me, I'm in the middle of something. And so, you know, it wasn't always perfect, but I was sure. after feeling how I made her feel and then getting her response about like, God, I'm just trying to see how your day was going. I'm sorry. I mean, then it was like, man, I don't ever want to make her feel like that. So then it was like this up and down and this balance and this trying to make everything harmonized together. I wanted to be an incredible father and a husband, but I also was trying to build this incredible business. So the communication between the two of us and getting her buy-in and like there was going to be a ton of commitment to the business, but then focusing that attention at home, shutting off my phone and taking time specifically focused on being present with my wife and my kids. It, you know, it hasn't been easy, but so are those some things you did? Like, you know, I know a lot of times people, you know, when they're building a business, they almost, you know, look at those systems or, uh, situations with their family and almost prideful, you uh-huh. know, like oh, I'm working so hard, you know, yeah. rather than the way you were thinking about how you're making your wife feel. Right. So when you had those conversations early on, was she, she, I'm well, obviously I already know this, but she was all in on you building the business. Right. Mm-hmm. How do you think it made her feel to watch you? going for it. I mean, do you think that that helped your guys' re- relationship that for once in your life, you were actually doing what you said you were going to do, that you were giving it your all and you were actually coming through on all the stuff you said? Yeah. Yeah. I think I was always good at making it seem like I was living up to my potential and talking a big game and all those years while I was drinking and puffing my chest about being the biggest, baddest dude on the block and good father and husband, you know, I was just, I was justifying all my behaviors back then. So yeah, when I, when I really started communicating those things to her and we had a lot of emotional conversations and I was, I was a wreck in that, that first year, there were so many emotions. I'd been, I'd been drunk and stoned for like 20 years. Yeah. How do you actually confront these fears yeah. and these challenges and these, yeah, maybe negative character traits that you'd built mm-hmm. that you got to change, right? Man, there was there was a lot of work to do, and yeah. a lot of emotions came out because I'd never dealt with emotions, and now I would I would get triggered easily, and you know some anger and some attitude coming out, but then also, man, I, I would like have these bursts of just violent crying, and like well, I could barely even compose myself, and I was like, where is all this coming from? And looking back on it now, it's just like. I'd never dealt with any of it. I just suppressed right. it and suppressed it and suppressed it. And then over that, that next year, it just all came pouring out of me. And then 
I just started going after it and talking about it and then delivering and, and creating and doing what I said I was going to do. And, you know, it wasn't perfect, but I, I told my wife along the way that I wanted, I wanted to be good at this and I wanted to create this business, but it doesn't, none of this means anything if I don't have you guys when we get done building this thing. So you got to have patience with me because I'm, I've just went through the last eight years of our marriage being kind of a shit show and not being all that present. So I got some making up to do, but I'm committed to making this thing work for us and for our family and for our future. I love what you're saying there, yeah. Jefferson. I think, uh, it's real. You know, you, the familiar in your fa in your life for a long time was the addiction and all those things you were dealing with, with all that drunken stone, like you're saying, that was the familiar, even though that was not an ideal situation. It was what you guys were used to. Right. Mm -hmm. And now you're starting something totally new. And even though it's a way healthier way to go, it's still the unfamiliar. And that's what scares us and make for making changes. Yeah. And kudos to you for, uh, being willing and, and, and overcoming that fear or facing that fear you're probably still on the path of overcoming it. I think that's a lifelong process, but facing that fear and going for it, I just think there's, there's too much refining needed in our lives for it to be easy. I mean, you're being refined, mm -hmm. I'm being refined, and that's not easy. You're saying, talking about those emotions coming out that year. It's because that refining is, it's, it's tough. Yeah, I think this process we're talking about is the difference between somebody making a decision to build a successful business or somebody making a decision to become a successful man, right? I mean, you mm -hmm. made a decision to become a great man. And in the process, part of that was building a great company, but it was also repairing that relationship with your wife and your, your children, you know, and, mm -hmm. and watch you do that. It's cool. So how, so how, so, so what are some things you've done with your, your kids too? Cause I, you know, I've watched it, I've watched you intentionally build great relationships with your kids. I mean, you've got to, 16 year old boy at home right is he 16 mm -hmm. 16 and so you know him watching you go through those times and then I think having a young boy at home and then now watching him who he is now today I'm sure yeah. you're proud right and so proud almost thank god I made those decisions at that moment to become mm -hmm. a great man right so what are some things you did you know that that led to this process that helped you build those relationships with your kids and uh i would say not only not just repair but also build them because i think that a lot of people maybe they don't have horrible relationships with their family but they sure could do a lot better right they 100 percent make a decision to go all in yeah i see a lot of it and especially as i've gone through these different stages of parenthood also and and kind of teetered on you know do i put some more effort into this or is it do I want to just model it after these other examples that I've had in my life of just keeping it surface level and having like a hugging relationship? But, you know, I, I had a great relationship with my dad, but it was pretty surface level. And I, I still, I'm a hugger and I'm a lover. And there's, you know, I've, I was, my daughter came in and snuggled me in bed the other night. And I've, when I woke up in the morning, I was like having this dream of like really wanting that love and that, like that snuggly time with my dad when I was a kid. And it was just like this weird, really innocent moment that I had like a flashback to being a kid. And I just didn't have a lot of that. So when I was drinking, my kids would come climb into bed with me and I would I'd get all fired up. And it's like, God, I'm trying to sleep. You know, it's like you're taking my time here. And I just kind of paid attention over time about how that stuff made me feel and how it made my kids feel. And same thing with the way that I treated my wife and how it made her feel and how I felt during those times and afterwards. So it was just trying to get aligned with the, the feelings that I had and how I made other people feel. And I always want to make people feel good, especially my wife and my kids. And now, you know, there's some trauma to overcome because my wife has these defense mechanisms built in without even saying anything. She kind of jumps to conclusions based off of the way that I treated her for the first eight years of our marriage. I don't blame her one bit. Yeah. She has a right to, right? You gave her the reason. Yeah. <laughs> and my kids do the same thing. Sure. So for so long, I conditioned them to react in these ways. And now it's like, dude, I get emotional when I think about it. Cause it's like, I got, I still got a lot of making up to do. Mm -hmm. And so when I, when I talk to my son and I'm trying to teach him how to do something, he immediately gets emotional and he gets defensive because I would used to be like, I mean, just I can figure it out, dude. Yeah. Yeah. And so he would get defensive. He's like, dad, I've already tried figuring it out. 
before I even said anything, I was like, God, you still got it. Yeah. yeah. So now it's like really just being intentional and being present and being understanding and empathetic and, and listening to him and, and having this one-on-one -on -one time. So we do, you know, I do one-on-one -on -one time with the kids and the cell phone's away, distractions are away. I'm trying to like build a relationship and have these intimate conversations with my kids so they can, they know that they can come to me and they can trust me with these conversations. Yeah. How do you, how often do you do that? So once a month with each one of the kids. Individually. Individually. Yep. And then we do lots of family stuff too, yeah. but that one-on-one -on -one time has been so, so important. Yeah. And with my little girls, I just barely started doing business trips with them also. So once a quarter, I'll do a business trip with one of the kids. They'll remember that forever. Oh, yeah. yeah. No doubt. They'll remember those times. And my daughter, the first one we did, my daughter was so excited. Yeah. She packed, she was packed and ready to go three weeks before the trip. And she had all of her baby doll stuff packed in its own suitcase. And she kept like adding more stuff to her suitcase. And she's like, dad, I'm going to bring this. I'm going to bring this. And then when we're there, we can do this. When we got to the Boise airport, they had an arcade in the airport and we were in yeah. a hurry to get to this, this meeting. And she's like, dad, there's an arcade in here. Can we come early when we come back so we can do the arcade? Yeah. And awesome. those are, I mean, she's 10 years old. So I remember a lot when I was 10, but those, I never did those kind of trips. Right. So those are the kind of memories that I want to make with my kids that, you know, I've got like the camping memories and some of the long drives to family reunions, and things that I remember, but my kids are going to remember those times. Yeah. Cause they're intentional moments that put your children in a position to watch you be a provider too. Right. Mm -hmm. Which I, I, you know, I think Brandon and I have been talking about this so much lately that I really think so many of these issues happening in our country today stem from the lack of strong fathers right? it's like so often it's just like it's like a normal thing in our society today to have a father not be present 100 percent, or it okay for men to not be men right mm -hmm. and it causes so many of these challenges you know I, I as you're talking about your daughter and going on a trip it just makes me think about what kind of expectations it sets for her when she starts looking for a husband you know, and, and how awesome is that, that that's the expectation that you set up for your children. So as she grows up, you already know her expectations are high, right? Mm -hmm. And so then you help your children in situations like this because they don't, they don't even realize it's happening. And as they grow up, that reflection or that com comparing themselves, kind of like you did, you know, want to cuddle with your dad as a, as a young boy, you know, just wanting, you know, I think every, every young boy wants to love on their dad or get some love from their dad. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, so sort of all of our children do, but I think as we grow up and then we provide those great examples, we're always comparing ourselves to how we felt when we were children, mm -hmm. you know? So think about how cool that is for your daughters to be able to grow up and reflect back on that. What a great, great piece of advice. Yeah, man. I love being a dad. It's yeah, a, it's awesome. It's an incredible blessing. So cool. We, uh, we, we get to improve and get better, right? If we, if we've been living away, we shouldn't be living, you know, those that are listening to this, you can, you can change, you can get better. And it's not, it's not easy to just change. Usually, mm -hmm. usually, I mean, it's, it can be, I think it can be easy if we're ready. Don't you think it's harder though? Uh, Jefferson, I think answer, answer this question. I mean, don't you think it would have been harder to, to stay in the place you were at than it is to change and get oh, to where man. you're at? Well, it's, it was hard on me psychologically because I knew it was against everything that I wanted to stand for. And you know, I try and make sense of it for people that I know and trust and love that are still in those places that I, you want so bad for them to come to these same realizations, but they get so deep into those patterns. It's like they're, my conscience was so loud all the time speaking to me in these ways, like this doesn't align. It's like, what the f are you doing? Why do you keep doing this to yourself? You know, it can be better, but you don't know how to yeah. get out. And some people just suppress it for so long that that voice or that urge just gets quieter and quieter and quieter until it's, it's non-existent. It's still there at some level, but they just keep suppressing it with food or with alcohol or with drugs or with any other type of addictions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, it's sad that that's how people su suppress these uncomfortable emotions because mm -hmm. rather than getting stronger and just pressing through it, they allow this weakness to continue let it erode in their life. Right. Mm -hmm. But it's cool to see. I mean, it's cool to see your story because I think, you know, so many people, whether they're winning in life or not right now that, it, you, you know, it's what you can do to your life in a short amount of time. I mean, you really went from rock bottom to four years later having a $20 million company. Mm -hmm. 
And it's not like anybody helped you in the process. It's not like you had someone give you a bunch of money. It's not like you all of a sudden had someone show up and give you something. You just made a decision and went out there and, and made it happen, right? You mm -hmm. built a great business, improved your family life. Uh, I was going to ask. Don't I mean, Go ahead. I, Go ahead. I, I was just going to ask because uh, I watched you. I don't know when it was. You showed up at my office. I don't know when that was. Is that 20? You were just getting started, I think. It was 2018, yep. And I'm like... Jefferson, I, like I hadn't seen you in years, right? I knew I knew you from Primerica, kind of, but mm -hmm. I didn't really know you. And you're like, hey, what's up, man? I'm just, I'm just here to check things out. I'm like, oh, cool. Maybe he's going to come be a recruit, right? And uh, my bay shop wasn't very big at the time, but you came. I think you came two or three weeks in a row and just mm -hmm. sat in the back and took notes. So, I mean, how much time and money have you invested in yourself the last four years in becoming who you are today that's helped you? Well, I, I stopped I stopped counting because the numbers started getting really high up there. But that's how it started was, you know, I, I wanted to get around successful men. And you were one of the only successful men that I knew of, and we didn't really have a relationship. But I think, I can't remember how I got your number. Oh, I ran into Lexi at the gym. Okay. Yeah. And, and I hadn't seen Lexi in forever, too. And so I was like, are you Lexi, Neil? <laughs> You don't know me, but, you know, we met one time at this event at uh, Lake Las Vegas. And she said, oh, yeah, I think I remember you and your wife. Yeah. So she kind of remembered me. And I said, you know, what? I've been thinking about getting a hold of Brandon. Can you give me his number? And then I was scared to death to call you. But I, I called and just said, hey, man, I, I want to come over to the meeting and kind of see how things are going. And, and it was really just to start getting around a positive environment. I loved when I was part of Primerica going to going to these events and being around all these successful people and the, the lingo and the success principles. And, and that was like that first taste outside of the stuff that I was doing with, with Grant Cardone that was more in person. Mm -hmm. And then I think in, uh, in 2018 and 2019, I didn't spend a lot of money. I was just focused on building the business and using the tools that I had to just go hard. And I, I was working 18 to 20 hour days for two years straight. And then in, in 2020, I went to this event called door to door con at the salt palace and I was there by myself and it was kind of a shitty feeling cause I, I still wasn't all that experienced in like initiating a conversation and networking. So I was like way out of my element. I didn't talk to one person the whole first day. How'd you end up at this event? Someone just told you about it or what? So it was, uh, they had been doing a bunch of Facebook marketing and it kept coming across as social an ad. Media. So I found it on social media. It was door to door. It was aligned. I, never done anything besides the Grant Cardone mentor program. So I wanted to plug into this environment and man, I, I didn't talk to anybody. I, I ran into Kale and Trevor. They're the owners of easier accounting. So I did talk to them, but they, I knew them. I didn't talk to anybody else. And then the second day it was like, man, I came all the way out here. I'm trying to make some moves on my business. I got to at least talk to a couple of people. The very first guy I talked to, this is an entire door to door, 2,500 people that are all from pest control, solar alarms, roofing. And I would imagine maybe there was a handful of window people there, but I doubt it. I've never really ran into any other window people except for this one guy. The very first person that I talked to, he was wearing an Arate syndicate hat. And I, I couldn't remember what the symbol was, but I just went and said, man, I recognize that symbol on your hat. Remind me what that is. That was like an exact word for word what I said. And he said, it's Arte Syndicate. You've heard of Ed Milet and Andy Fursilla. They put on this, this mentor program. And I was like, oh, that's right. That's where I saw that. And then the guy that was standing next to him was his COO. And I had just went into their office like two weeks before that. I was kind of going to poach one of their guys that I knew about that was like a, a trainer, recruiter. And I just walked into their office. And he was there, and she's like, you, you're the guy that came into our office a couple weeks ago. And I was like, I get that all the time. I mean, everybody thinks I look like their cousin or something. I think it's just because I'm bald. And he's like, no. Remember <laughs> you said that you were across the street eating lunch, and you came over to see how we were doing? I was like, oh, my God, you guys are with Apex? Wow. <laughs> so it was crazy. And, but that led to a, a couple of conversations. And this is all like very industry specific at this door to door con. So it's solar roofing, pest control, and all these breakout rooms are industry specific. So the ones that weren't industry specific, I ended up in the same room with these guys every step of the day, that, that second day, I talked to them multiple times 
And then it led to a conversation about consulting and their best year ever was 6 million and their goal was 10 million. And so now I'm doing the comparing thing again. It's like these two dill weeds is like, man, these freaking guys can do it. I know I can do it. So my goal changed from, I walked into that event, going to double my 2019. So I was going to do 4 million in 2020. Then he told me his best year was 6 million. So right there in that moment, I was like, Fuck, I'm going for 6 million now. And then right at the end of the day, he told me that his goal was 10 million. And he had just got done doing this consulting program with the guy that runs this event. And he thinks that if, if I want to hit those big goals, that the consulting would help with the recruiting, with the systems and processes. So I made a goal to do 6 million and then 10 million before the day was up when he told me 10 million. And I went and got involved with this consulting deal that was, it was 60 grand. So it was more money than I had and it was more money than I'd ever spent on anything. I didn't even like have a car payment or anything at this time. So I was scared to death and the, luckily he let me put it on a couple of credit cards so I could make my first down payment so on, on this the thing. spot. You, you purchased yep. this. I program. was like <laughs> at this event, I'm all in. Yep. I think you can help me. I'm all in. I've been thinking about coaching and consulting, just haven't found the right fit yet. I think this is the right what fit. What was Shandell saying? I never even asked her. Yeah. Like, I got to do this. No, I got home and I said, I, uh, I just got us involved in this consulting program. And then I kind of like planted a couple of seeds. And then like a week later, I told her how much it was. And she's like, 60 grand? You didn't <laughs> tell me it was 60 grand? <laughs> okay, so let's talk about this. So you invested 60000 on a whim at the event. Two years ago. Two years, two years ago. ago, what did you do in sales? Uh, what what month of the year was this event at? So that was in January. Okay, so it was in January. So what did you end up doing in sales in 2020? So we did 10 million. So you did 10 million. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you invested 60 grand. I mean, what are the odds that if you didn't invest into that? Oh, I would have never hit it. I mean, never. what do you think you would have done that year? Honestly, like I would have. I would hit exactly what I was shooting for. I would have hit four million. So, was so it, it the made you six million dollars. It made me an extra six million in sales. So was it the program? Was it the contacts you make? Was it was it all of it? Was it what was it? What was I think it, that, it was a combination of just my ability to think that big, like having exposure to somebody who had done it, and comparing myself to these guys. It's like these these guys can do it. I know I can do it. Yeah. I mean, they're they're a couple of just average guys. Right. I'm better than they are. Yeah. And they, they may have like five or six years ahead of me, but if I can apply some of these things that I learn with the culture and the daily meetings and the training and the, you know, being the leader and the communicator that I know that I can be, that I was pretty rough around the edges at that time. But that whole year, that was another year of just balls to the wall. It was a huge commitment. I was scared to death signing that $60,000 deal because now it was me committing. I'd, I'd gotten a little comfortable at the end of 2019. I just made more money in the past two years than I'd ever made, and I was comfortable. And I'd, man, sure. I, was, I wasn't sure if I was ready for a big commitment like that. Right. But you made it. But I did it. Yeah. Yeah, I think th there's no way to ever find out exactly what it is, right, that, that changes someone's life in an event like that. It's just being willing to go, being willing to get committed, and to be willing to... Um, go all in, whether that's 60,000 for an event or whether it's make a commitment that this is the time that you're going to go back and change and do something different or whatever it may be. Right. Mm -hmm. And that reminds me, you're putting on an event actually called all in in September, right? Yep. Yeah. We've got an event that's focused on helping small businesses scale from six and seven figures up to, you know, mid seven figures and eight figures. And it's, it's based off a lot of the principles that have helped me scale my business from you know, we've, we've now produced over $35 million in, in sales in the past four years. And I've, all the companies that I've worked alongside and helped consult, they deal with all these same issues. And sometimes it's just the belief. Sometimes it's a combination of the systems and processes and belief and the, the comp plans. But there's, there's all these little simple things that when you're in it day to day, you can't see past like this far. Right. I think, I think you, you know, you're talking about the tangibles there, right? The tangibles you need to know and learn. Mm -hmm. But I think there's some intangibles and in telling your story here that you got like investing the 60,000, something changed in your brain. You know, if you read uh, Napoleon Hill's outwitting the devil and he, he's trying to figure out how he's going to fund his uh, magazine, I believe. And he lived in West Virginia and he had a, he just, had a feeling and a, and a voice say, go to Philadelphia and you'll find the funding. I had no idea where to go. Mm -hmm. Goes to Philadelphia, 
books the most expensive room in Philadelphia for three nights, right? Can't even afford that. He spent all his money on that. And through that process, found the guy who was an editor in one of his other articles or something that ended up funding everything, right? Yeah. And I think, uh, you know, there's there's something that, that changes in your brain. Again, it's an intangible thing that you may get at an event or reading a book or, I mean, your case was investing the money and you were at the right, you were at the right event too. Mm-hmm. I mean, you, you were there. And same thing happened to me when I came to my first Primerica meeting and I saw a guy named Chris Howard making a million a year in income. And up to that point, I thought, man, if I could make 50, 60 grand a year, run my own schedule, I'd be yeah, happy. Incredible. <laughs> and then I see that and I go, and then, and then I, I, I had a trainer who gave me this set of audios that was Hector Lamarck, who was making $3 million a year. And I started listening to those audios, and it, it, was, it was the tangibles, right, of exactly what to say, what to do, how to do it. Mm-hmm. And it's the combination between seeing Chris Howard's income and his income, being in the environment, and those audios that are tangibles, something changed in my mm-hmm. brain. And I, I called my mom on a Saturday morning training, like two or three months in the business, and said, Mom, I want to make a million a year of this thing. And it was like that clear. Just like flipped a switch of belief yeah. that it was possible yeah. for you. That clear. Yep. And I see that same thing happening with you two yeah. years ago. Mm-hmm. And now you're going to do what? What did you say? 20 million yeah, plus we'll this year? Close to 20 million in yeah. sales this year. That's awesome. What a great story. All while building a great family and, 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 and then staying in great shape too. Oh, fitness. So yeah. I think a lot of people, I mean, this is what's cool. Cause I'm, I'm trying to flex here while I'm on this camera so I can look as big as <laughs> it's easy to beat you. You're going to have to flex harder, bro. <laughs> <laughs> um, but oh, by the way, Jeff, uh, I just have Kirtland water and he, that wasn't good enough. So we had to go get this well water. This is better for you. Yeah. In case anybody wants to know. We got a whole drink, explanation drink, of why well water too. That's right. Since we're getting into fitness right now. Uh, if you're going to drink water, drink water is good for you. Every time I think I'm doing a good job, Jeff comes in and starts telling me something that <laughs> is better. And I go, that makes a lot of sense, Jeff. At hey, first I go, ah, yeah. oh, he's full of it. And then he starts explaining it, right, Jefferson? Yeah. It's like, that makes total sense. It's like, I thought just drinking water was fine. Yeah. I, I drink water out of the tap all the time. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Fluoride and chlorine and glyphosates, all kind of stuff, man. We're chewing gum before the podcast here, and Jeff goes, you know, chewing gum messes up your... your makes you constipated. Makes you constipated. Chewing gum. Yeah. And then you explain why, and it go, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I and I go, man. what if I have bad breath? He goes, you wouldn't have bad breath if you had... Didn't have gut issues, right? <laughs> it's true. <laughs> Isn't it? Right? It's true. No, it's, but so I think this a lot... This is gold. Uh, serious. <laughs> I guess, if that's what you want to call it. <laughs> But no, Jeff said, I'm proud of you, man, because I've watched, I've watched you and, and from afar, you know, watch you build a business, build this great family. And, and then also you've stayed in great shape and then you've stayed mega disciplined on all of those things. Right. So, you know, a lot of times people will start building a business and they'll go, oh, well, I'm not in good shape because I'm building a company Mm -hmm. or, you know, oh yeah, my, you know, I'm, I'm not making a lot of money because my relationship with my family are really good. And so they start justifying and making excuses why they're underperforming in other areas of their life. And you haven't done that. You made a decision to perform at a high level. I want to be good at all of them, man. So how do you do that? What separates you from most people? I mean, what is it that you see that, you know, causes most people maybe to make those excuses and what you've done differently that allows you to win in all of them? I think it's, it's kind of a combination of, my schedule and just not settling for less. Like I, I have expectations of myself now and I know what's possible for me. So for one, I get up, you know, two or three hours before most people get up. So when you've tallied that up over a year and two years and three years and been doing this for four years now, you know, I've got like extra months of extra time each year that I have above and beyond everybody else that doesn't get up as early and work as long as I do. Right. And I'm, you know, I'm not gonna do that forever and maybe it's not healthy, but I, as long as I can sustain it and I am healthy and feed myself and giving myself the fuel and doing all the things that I feel are necessary to keep going at that pace, man, I can accomplish a lot more than most people just by getting up a couple extra hours early. I right. heard you say something on your social media a few days ago, you, I don't know if you remember mm-hmm. talking about sleep and some, some nights you might get like three hours of sleep. What's your attitude? I'm only getting three hours of sleep tonight. What's your yeah. attitude towards that? So I, I read this book last year and it's called the miracle morning by Hal Elrod. And it's, it's an incredible book. And there's one of the parts that st- 
stuck out the most. There's, there's always like one or two parts of a book that really stick out whenever I read a book. And that's all I need is just that one, that one nugget. And for this book, it was your mornings. You can compare to either you're dreading it or you can compare it to like a Christmas morning. So every night when I go to bed, when I check my alarm, it tells me exactly how long until my alarm goes off. And it's, you know, last night it said like five hours and 56 minutes. I was, I was celebrating my anniversary with my wife. So I got a little extra sleep last night, but for the most part, whenever I'm going to sleep, it barely ever says more than an hour with other than three or four. You know, you're not supposed to get more sleep when you celebrate your anniversary. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just like, just an anniversary tip. I don't know. I'm just <laughs> off subject. Go ahead. <laughs> yes. Well, we, we got plenty of activities in, but, uh, <laughs> sleep for me is important because I, you know, I want to have energy, Yeah. but then also I, I spent years and years and years dreading getting less than eight hours of sleep. And every night I would go to bed and I knew that I was going to get less than eight hours. I'm like, Oh God, I got to wake up in eight hours. And so every morning I'd wake up, didn't matter how much sleep I got, I'd be exhausted and I'd have a terrible attitude and I'd be dragging ass. And if my wife woke me up five minutes before my alarm, I'd lose my mind. But now it's like, I go to bed and I was setting my alarm. It's like, man, I got three hours and 47 minutes till I got to wake up. Tomorrow's going to be I a get fantastic sleep day. Yep. Yep. That's good, good, that's yep. That's great sleep attitude. Tonight. Yeah, per- yeah well, perspective, right? Yeah. How, what, what is the first thought when you wake up? So, so I mean. It's really good. I'm the type of, I need my sleep, right? Like I I feel like I need seven. You're probably going, you're crazy, but I feel like I need that. So um, I guess, I don't know what I'm asking here. I I feel like this. I I feel like you should design your life the way you know you're going to thrive. Not, you know, some people say, oh, I need eight. But it's not, you don't need eight. You're just lazy, right? Some Some people I think genuinely need eight. Can you adjust your body to only need five hours of sleep? No, I, I think at a certain point in your life, I mean, the lack of sleep, your, your body is going to give somewhere, mm-hmm. right, with the lack of sleep. You just heard Jefferson say, I'm not going to do that forever, you know, unless he can, which we all, we all know how sleep works, right? But I also think your perspective has a lot to do with it, and, I, and, and more importantly, where you invest your energy. I feel like, and maybe Jefferson, I'm wrong, please give me some input, but I feel like most people invest so much energy and stuff that doesn't improve their life and that's why they need so much rest rather than investing things that give them more energy right do i invest my time my family i I mean i'm i'm fired up when i spend more time with my family i'm I'm pumped right Mm -hmm. when i when i spend time with friends who i'm motivated to be around and they inspire me i'm pumped i don't need i don't want i don't want to go to sleep after those situations i i'm awake so i think a lot of it has to do with those choices more than anything. And then, and then another thing I, I see is diet, right? Like what do people eat? You know, you watch people, they're drinking soda and, you know, they go to Starbucks and get these sugary coffee drinks and right. they're eating junk all day and then they wonder why they're tired. So I think, you know, I think when it comes to sleep, most people are never to a place where that couple of hours even getting to get them to a place where they can compete with someone like Jefferson because they haven't done all the stuff up to that point to go, I think if I had a couple of extra hours, imagine what I could do today. Mm -hmm. Would you agree with that? hundred percent. Yeah. Most people don't have the discipline to use the extra hours where every single hour of my day is scheduled out and it's intentional. And my, my calendar two years ago, didn't have anything on it, but slowly I've just implemented more discipline and more structure in my life to where if, if I'm going to get up that early, I know exactly what I'm doing. I've got from the time I get up until I'm walking through the gym door, it's 46 minutes. And then I'm fasting until 12 or one o'clock. And in between that time, I'm spending a little bit of time with my kids and getting them ready for school. And we're doing breakfast and we're talking about dreams and, you know, the fun stuff that you talk about with little kids. And then I'm hauling ass to go get ready. And I'm, I'm just excited about each one of these next steps of my day. And I know exactly how it's going to play out. Do you feel like that you have more freedom because you're more disciplined? Because that's how I felt like, so, so when I started in business, I was like this a type personality, you know, drive fast, these throw at the back seat of my car. My car was always filthy. I was going a million miles an hour, mm-hmm. always five minutes late to everything. And Brandon actually influenced me a lot because he's so structured right? He's always structured, never late for anything, you know? 
and that influenced me. But I almost felt like before I was like, I don't have time. I don't have time to do this. Or man, I'm in a hurry. I got to yeah. go here. I got to go there. But it seemed like over the years, the more I've gotten structured, the more I've been deliberate in my schedule, the more free that I feel on a daily mm-hmm. basis. I don't know, Brandon. Maybe that's how you've always felt. But w- what's your comments on that? Yeah, I agree 100. percent And I've I've been through in and out of that feeling where, man, I've, I've got so much that I want to accomplish and I feel like it, it never happens fast enough. So then I, I go, I go hard and I, I schedule stuff tighter together, but then it almost feels like it's counterproductive because now I'm, I'm trying to squeeze too much in. So then I'll go back to 15 to 30 minute gaps between stuff. So I've got a little bit of time to catch up with my wife and make a call to my kids. And there's always stuff that I need to, that I'm falling behind on that I can get caught up with. So yeah, the, the more that I've been structured and used my calendar and been intentional about the time in between and the little breaks and making time for eating, the more, the calmer I am. And then the more present and the more aware that I am of this, the situations and you, you can just operate at a higher level when you don't have that anxiety that's always kind of teasing you about what's next and am I going to be late and is there enough time to get this done and all that. Right. You're creating your life. You're not reacting to life. Right. Right. And uh, I think that's a big key. And uh, talking about uh, just having the energy to move forward. When we have goals that excite us and then we have a plan, which you have every single day, and you follow that plan and you know you're getting closer to your goals, those goals drive you right? To, to totally. maybe need that, yeah. that le- less rest and everything else. Mm-hmm. Um, so, I mean, Jefferson, I mean, you, 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 uh, recently, well, it's been a while now, been probably a year or more now you, you, you entered yourself into a fitness competition. Yeah. It's almost been, uh, in 10 days, it'll have been a year since I competed in that competition. How'd you do in that competition? I won. You won it. And it's your first one you've ever done. Uh-huh. You just decided I'm going to go do this. And, and did yeah. you, did, when you started it, did you go, I'm going to win this or did you go, I'm going to do this to do, do the best I can do. What was your attitude? So, yeah, I think that I, I don't know if I originally went in with the mindset that I was going to win. I, I just got done doing 75 hard. I finished at the end of 2020 and it was a big accomplishment. It was a lot of discipline. I failed once at 27 days. And then the next time I did it, I was not going to make any excuses. I was going to get it done. I was doing workouts at one o'clock in the morning, in the rain, in the snow, and I, I got it done. Because what is 70 hard? Explain to people. I mean, if they don't know what it is, what is 75 so hard? So 75 hard, if you haven't heard of it, you got to look it up. If you, if you need a challenge in your life, if you want to go to the next level in your discipline and your commitment and your consistency with your habits, then it's, uh, it's a sequence of things you have to do every day. And without fail, if you miss one of them, you have to start over. For 75 days. For 75 days straight, you got to uh, eat healthy. You got to drink a gallon of water. You got to take a picture, a progress picture every day for 75 days. You got to do two workouts a day for 45 minutes. One of them has to be outdoors. You can do both of them outdoors. And then there read may, a book. Uh, you got to read 10 pages a day. And I think, I think that's all of them. And then there's different phases also. I didn't ever go on to the next phases. But that, that built a lot of confidence in me to go out and accomplish something big and be consistent and disciplined. And no matter what the circumstances were, I, I showed up to Nashville one night at 10 o'clock just expecting to go for a, a quick walk. And we, uh, we touched down in Nashville. It's a freaking downpour. And it wasn't letting up. So at, by the time I got to the hotel, it was 11. And by midnight, I was soaked to the bone because I just had to do a outdoor 45 minute workout, but I, I didn't make any excuses. So after that, then it was like, I toyed around with doing one of these physique shows and my trainer is a bodybuilder and he has an incredible physique. And he'd always asked me if I wanted to do, it. he's like, man, you got a great physique. You gotta, we gotta train you to do one of these. You can, I'll teach you how to do it all. And I can hook you up with one of the best coaches in the industry. And I finally just made the commitment and I didn't do any preparation. I just, one day I just decided, Okay, I'm going to do it. There's 100 days until this next show. So I started in March, and it was June 12th. And I've, I did all the, I got the, the trainer all lined out and the meal plans and 100 days straight of being disciplined. And then halfway through it, I'm like, man, if I'm going to, if I'm going to make this kind of sacrifice and do this kind of crap to my body, I may as well try and win. 
So by the end of it, those last two weeks, I was up to two hours of cardio a day. Sorry to cut you off, but that reminds me of a good thing I used to tell everybody. There's a difference between trying to play in a game and win a game, right? There's a big difference. Trying to, like, you know, if if, if you're going to start a business, difference between trying to just start a business, have a successful business, or trying to win in that industry, right? Totally different mentality. Yeah, it's awesome. So, I I mean, I went hard those last, those last 50 days were every single day, seven days a week, without fail, I was at the gym, hitting the weights, doing the cardio, and I was cutting that entire 100 days. So I was also trying to maintain my muscle mass. And so going into that event, man, I almost just knew I, it was already a done deal. I knew I was going to win. And there was a, it was a smaller event, so I've been tempted to go back and do a bigger event and challenge myself on a bigger stage with more guys. But that's, uh, that's the same mentality that I took in uh, 2019 when I prepared for a motocross race after not racing for 11 years I got my ass kicked on that race 11 years before that and I was I was going to go for a top five and then halfway through it I was like fuck it I'm going to win this thing I was putting in more work than anybody and I knew that I could win and so I went and trained my ass off and I I beat the next guy by 12 minutes on that race Wow. wow so so it seems like there's this common thread that I think is awesome that when you started your business, you found a mentor, you found someone who would pour into you, even at that time, it was kind of before, it was Grant Cardone, right, really? Mm-hmm. And then you've had trainers in, in fitness, and in, in really in everything you've done, you've sought out people to help you get better in everything. Is that yeah. right? Yeah. Why? I mean, most people don't do that. Most most people want to invest. So you're not only investing in money in that 60000 I've also watched you invest money into people with your health. I've watched you invest money into growing your mindset. I've watched you invest money into uh, things that are going to help you become a better father. Hunting. Hunting. Yeah, all these things. Getting better. I've yeah. watched you invest money into things you want to get better at. Yeah. What's your mindset behind that? Because we know that most people don't. I right? know. You're getting ready to put on an event. At the end of the event, there's going to be all these people. And... You know, five or ten percent of those people at that event are going to say, "You know what? I'm going to take my life to the next level. I'm going to invest in myself to go get mm-hmm. better." It's a small percentage. It is a small percentage. But just so people know, you also have a coach to help you put on the best event. Yep. Yeah. yeah I mean, I want to accelerate things, and you know, I feel like I'm pretty smart and I'm naturally talented at a lot of things. But there's just some things that I'm inexperienced at, and I don't have the time or the experience for events or for fitness or for my diet or for, you know, personal development, some of these big areas that I want to accelerate the process. So what better way to accelerate the process than to get into in front of somebody that's already done it, that's experienced these things, that's made all the mistakes that I would inevitably make myself if I tried to go do it myself, but I can skip past some of those things. It's still important. You learn a lot of the shit along the way to help you grow, but there's a lot of the things that are unnecessary for you to learn if you can bypass those by getting in front of somebody who's already learned those things the hard way. Right. It's like most people aren't willing to invest the money into coaches and mentors and people, yeah. but they don't realize what it's costing them not to. Yeah. Right. How much, how much further ahead you get by investing a little bit of money and, and bypassing all of these bumps in the road or yeah. maybe just taking a smoother path. And listen, all of the investments that I've made have not been, have not been good investments. Sometimes I feel like I'm making a good decision and, you know, I've, I've got to commit to this relationship and, and my accountability and, and whatever it's going to take to get my value out of that. Sometimes the person that I, I invested in for that is not delivering on their side or I was lacking in some of the areas too and I just wasn't able to get the value out of it. But that's, that's one of the challenges is that I, I get people all the time. They see me a part of these mentor groups and the, the coaching and consulting and going to events and I, I have several people ask me at at each one of these events, like, what's your, how do you calculate your ROI? (laughs) It's like, I don't, I just know that I'm here for a reason to get something out of this. And it's my responsibility to get the value. I'm not worried about calculating ROI. My ROI is in my track record. I went from being the freaking guy on the couch and being a freaking wreck and almost throwing my marriage away and going to jail to owning a $20 million business, we've produced over $35 million in revenue. Yeah. All while having a successful family and staying in great shape. So there's, there's your ROI right that's there. Big, well, I think, I think that's huge. I think you're, uh, you're an action driven guy. And I think so many people are trying to 
overthink or overanalyze before they go. And like, yeah. hey, what's my ROI before I schedule, before I commit to this event? Mm-hmm. I don't think you were thinking that when you What's your that ROI experience. on zero investment? Right. Yeah. <laughs> like, right. What's your ROI on zero? Anything times nothing. zero is zero. Yeah. yeah. It's like, what are, you, what are you trying to get out of no yeah. in, investment? No, I, th- I think, uh, in, 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 I don't want to say in every case, but in a lot of cases, you know, you, you got to pull the trigger and take the shot. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, I've probably taken shots I shouldn't have, I have taken shots I shouldn't have taken that haven't worked out well, but mm-hmm. it's because I'm an action driven guy. And I know if I don't take action, nothing's going to happen. Exactly. So not everything's been perfect for you either. You're, mm-hmm. you're saying you've had some that just haven't worked out, but you, you, you made an educated decision based on your experience and you make the best decision you can on that. And, but you got to go. Not yeah, everything's going to be perfectly in, in place. You almost wonder, I mean, it's never going to work out perfect. It's That's what experience is. It's like you almost question somebody who claims that everything has worked out perfectly. Oh, for sure. Right? It's like, come yeah. on, man. If, if you haven't made any mistakes, I question when is that mistake coming, right? Mm-hmm. When, when have you made some decisions that you look back on and go like, dang, man, I should have made a different decision. Aren't those the kind of people we really want to learn from? Mm-hmm. The ones that say, hey, I made this decision one time and here's what happened. I promise if I would have done this, it would have it would have yielded a different result, and yeah, that if, was the result I desired. If you've never failed, why do I want to listen to you? I mean, what's going to happen when you do fail? Exactly, <laughs> I need to know. Mm-hmm. It's the whole Ronda Rousey thing, right? right. I, I'll never forget. My wife bought Ronda Rousey's book the same day she fought. That chick got kicked in the face and never came back. And I told my wife, "Don't read that book." Yeah. There's no reason to read this book because she's in a combat sport. The one time she gets knocked out, we never hear from her again. It's like. I think that it's it's a good thing. I think, you know, you see that in sports. We watch, you, you watch people get knocked out in boxing. They come back stronger and you go, those are the people that you respect and you admire. The stories like Rocky where he gets knocked down over and over, over and then just keeps coming back or the stories like Rudy, right? Mm-hmm. And these are the stories that we just love because they are the epitome of success. However, I do think most people desire it to be this like straight comfortable path to success like oh yeah i just found a mentor and he i think we all think way. we want that but deep down we know that we're not going to become anything great yeah. with that right we all want it to be easy but at the same time i mean life's not fulfilling if we don't have the challenges and overcome those challenges and have the have the failures that we learn from and get better from yeah we get stronger because we do hard shit Right. right, whether that's, that's in business or fitness or marriage or being a parent, right? I always tell her, be, being a parent, like I, I feel like God called me to be a father, but it's also the hardest thing I've ever done, right? But it's the thing that's the most rewarding, but it's also most rewarding because it's the most challenging, you know? But it's only the most challenging because I feel like I put a tremendous amount of effort into that same thing, right? Sure. And I feel like anybody that puts a tremendous amount of effort into anything is going to have struggles and challenges, and then how they respond to those struggles and challenges is going to determine their reward and who they become through that process, regardless of what that process is. How about this, though? So as you were talking about that, there's, I think there's a special ability by entrepreneurs to kind of block out all that negative shit uh, to forget about it. Right? Yeah. My <laughs> wife's got to always remind me, do you, don't you remember when that <laughs> happened? I'm like, I really, yeah, so, now that you bring it up, I remember, but yeah. Cause I, I mean, I've had a ton of wins, but all of the hard times and all the challenges and all the anxiety and the uncertainty and the, the most difficult times I've gone through with my business, they still all happened. I just don't think about those. You know why? Cause we're never talking about that shit. We're talking about the, the things that cause people to be attracted because we're leaders, right? We want to attract people to a vision, to a cause, to a mission, yeah. to something we're trying to accomplish. And if that's all we're ever thinking about, yeah, I think we, we kind of reduce the pain from all those struggles that we went through. I think women through. do that with babies, right? Yeah, definitely. They I, have a baby and they're like, I'm never doing this again. And then like a month later, like, I'd like to have another one. <laughs> that is <laughs> true. true. That is true. And now men can have babies, apparently, yeah. so. Um, that, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Ask Google. <laughs> can I say? Can I say that? <laughs> uh, That's what I hear. I don't know. I don't, I don't, I don't, yeah, I don't know how that works, but, <laughs> but yeah, I think I, w- I was talking about this with my team. We just did this leadership retreat, and my mom works for me, and, and our dynamic has changed as you know, son and mother because it's it's now a lot of business, and all the conversations that she was so used to me having with her for all those years, where she was like my 
my confidant and the, the person that I would go to when I, when I needed some advice and I needed to talk about some of the challenges that I was going through. I haven't done that for years now because it's, it's that same type of deal. It's like, I can't very well go to my, my employees and the people that work for me and tell them about all the challenges and the uncertainty that I have. Right. I just keep that stuff all bottled up and I talk about it with my wife and then it's always where are we going and what's next and production and looking for a solution to that problem, right? Solutions yeah. with my, with my people, but it's, you know, with my mom, it's caused this, this tension now because she, she gets emotional about it. She wants to be my mom. She's your mom. Yeah. And it's, you know, I'm trying to explain to her <laughs> in as tactful way as possible. It's like, yeah, it doesn't work. doesn't work that way to, just, talk, to, to worry about the problems. Right. Yeah. And to look at, it doesn't work that way. You got to, solutions driven it's yeah. so natural for us to look at a problem and go oh my gosh and worry about that problem and guess what happens the problem grows <laughs> yeah. yeah i i, I mean i think it's you know I, I don't know i haven't been there i haven't seen the perspective but it's probably she just wants to know she's still got your heart yeah you know there's probably so much mind sure. and emotion and uh you know planning and all that kind of stuff she's just, man i still got my baby boy's heart you know so i'm yep. sure so yeah that's uh it's it takes some extra work and it's that's why a lot of family businesses don't work out, man. It's you're, you're mixing things that people aren't used to mixing and it takes some versatility and it takes some commitment. I also think it's that part of it is because I had, you know, I had the privilege of working with my mother-in-law and a lot of my family for a lot of years. And I, I actually think it goes back to a lot, how, just how you treat people. Right. And I've watched you do an incredible job of this, just treating everybody, no matter where we go. It doesn't matter if it's a server at a restaurant, doesn't matter if it's a valet guy, doesn't matter who it is, right? That you're treating them well. And I think a lot of times when people are in business with their family, they think that it's almost like they have this past to treat their family different, mm -hmm. you know? And if, if people can get, you know, if those of you that are working together with your family, if you can treat your family like they're the most important people in the world to you and not thinking, well, you have to be here regardless rather than I'm so glad you're here and I'm going to treat you like it. I think that that helps that relationship dynamic a lot more. I really believe that people have most of the family struggles inside of a business because they think they have the right to treat them. However, mm -hmm. yeah, know. I agree. That's a, it's a tough thing. It, it is. I remember the, the first month I hired my mom, I was trying to figure out how to write her an email. And so I wrote Tina one time and spelled her first name. I said, Tina. And I, then I asked her something. And then the very next email, she said, don't ever call me Tina again. <laughs> <laughs> Good for her. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So yeah, dude, it's, it takes some time to get used to it and to understand what the dynamic can still be. And that those are still the most important relationships in your life. Mm -hmm. Your family never goes away. Right. We'll have, we'll have friends and acquaintances that kind of come and go. Mm -hmm. But our family is always going to be the closest. So whether you're in business or not, those are the, the most cherished relationships in your life and worth the effort to make sure that they stay healthy. Absolutely. Which takes effort and focus mm -hmm. and yeah, deliberate attention. Mm -hmm. Right. But let, let's if, if we really put that kind of deliberate attention into our people, too, that we're trying to lead and help go to the next level in their lives, we're going to get a far better turnout as well. Right. Absolutely, man. I, mean, I Absolutely. feel like so many leaders are willing to treat their people like family. Rather, they treat them like, like a manager, not mm -hmm. a leader. I feel like a good leader treats people, right? Like, like I never, Brandon, I never felt like you were my boss or anything like that. I, I always felt like... I was your boss at first, though. I know. You were. That's what yeah. I'm saying. Like, yeah. But I never yeah. felt like that. Right. You know what I mean? I always felt like you treated me, you, you treated me like you would treat your brother. You yeah. know what I mean? And I think over the years, because that wasn't, that wasn't me by any means, right? If I had a struggle with somebody or a challenge with somebody, it's almost like, you know, anger was the only way I knew how to handle it. Even if I'm sad, I just handle it with anger, mm -hmm. you know, which is dumb, but you don't treat people you love with anger, but that's the only tool I knew how to use. But over the years, as I saw the way people around me, the way successful people treat other people, you realize like, oh, like it's okay to be a strong man and respond with an emotion of respect and love and empathy. You're still a strong man. I think a lot of times we look at these men that treat people this way. They try to be these tough, strong men. And really, it just makes them look so weak, mm -hmm. you know? Yep, weak and inexperienced. I've, I have similar experiences. I grew up the oldest of four boys and being raised by a, a man's man, you know, firefighter, contractor dad that was not all that emotionally available. 
that was how he responded to us our whole life. So mm -hmm. that was the only way that we knew how to treat each other. And that transitioned into my leadership style too. And I lack of patience and lack of communication skills and handling things reactively. Right. And I burned, man, I, I burned a lot of bridges. And that was kind of along the way, the way that my brothers felt when I treated them like that and initially getting started as a leader and how I, I knew that I was making people feel led me down this path. And I'm sure you guys have similar experiences where you've, you don't want to ever make somebody feel like that again. How did you become aware of that? Because you obviously weren't aware what you were doing early on. You were just reacting based yeah. on your programming. What changed for you to where you, you became aware of, Hey, I, I don't like to be treated this way. Why would I be treating other people this way? What, yeah. what changed? You know, I think that in one way or another, I was aware. I just didn't have the tools or the intentionality to change anything about it early on. Uh, I, I built a house with my brother back in like 2005 and we just did it just me and him and it was this huge house it was for Uncle Ben and it was an incredibly designed he's an architect so he built this incredible design for his house and we had to do all these intricate cuts and two-story and special kind of soffit and fascia and it was it was intense and I knew how to do it all but Justin my little brother wasn't all that experienced and I had so little patience with him and I, I treated him like shit. And I was aware the whole time, but I just didn't know how to do it differently. And then I would get done and I'd be like, man, I, I did it again. I don't even know. I don't even know how to do it. Different. How do I change? How this? do I change this? Yeah. So and what was, did you do to change it? So then it was just first, it was like the awareness. Like I want to change this. I don't want to ever make somebody feel like that again. So then each time after I would have a conversation with somebody, it was kind of doing a little reflection and Sometimes I would justify it, and sometimes I would be like, man, I just, how can I do that different next time? It, and it goes all the way back to, like, when I was a little kid. I would react, and one brother would get in a fight with another brother, and then I'd have to clean it up, and I'd kick both their asses, and then I'd end up crying and picking them up off the ground and feeling sorry about it. And I didn't want to do that, but I just reacted, mm -hmm. and I was emotional, and I carried that throughout, like, most of my 20s, even with my, my wife and my kids. But it, I mean, it just took me a long time. And thank goodness my family loved me and, and put up with my ass long enough for me to make some changes because I, I treated people pretty poorly. And it was just being in, intentional about it and being aware and just slowly doing little things to help get better at every time. Very awesome. good. Man, uh, this has been awesome today. I, I just think... Uh, I hope those that are, that are watching this can see this table and we've had some success in our lives. I, I would, I would say we've, we're, we've been blessed with success, not 100%. just business family. We're super blessed and I hope people watching this would go, okay, these guys have done something, not necessarily because of the most talented or the most good looking with the exception of me, of course, but because they showed up every day with a positive attitude. I was joking about that, Jeff. We, we already knew that was a joke. I mean, that's all. <laughs> that was obvious. That's why we didn't even laugh, dude. <laughs> right, yeah. Uh, it was like crickets. And that was getting a little bit uh, awkward in here. Uh, but I, I hope people can see that, you know, yeah, we just show up every day, try to get better, have a positive attitude, work. We try to be smart with our decisions, right? And uh, there's so many people out there that I think are struggling. Am I good enough? Can, can I, can I do this? Can I be a good father? Can I be a good business leader? Can, um, you know, whatever. And, and if, if you'll show up with the right attitude every single day and not stop, you can, you can get better. Right. And I think the world out there, it's going to continue to get tougher out there for those who don't do that, who don't show up with a positive attitude. It's it always tougher for people that are weak, man. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Life right. is hard if you're weak. Right. So if you make a decision to, Okay, maybe you go, man, I feel weak right now. Well, what are you doing to get stronger right. in all these areas we're talking about? Mm -hmm. And be careful as you wish for strength because then you got to do some hard shit because that's what makes you strong. You're going to be refined, man. Yep. You're, you're, you're going to make those comes first steps. It comes up to steps. a level of commitment. Yep. Yep. Sometimes it's hard to commit at that level. Yeah. But it's, it's just doing the little things consistently. These, these success principles are not that sophisticated. They're no. just no. simple things repeated on a daily basis no. for a long enough period of time for you to see some success. I just, I just fully believe as soon as, as soon as somebody who's going to go do something special makes that decision, the devil's going to fight like crazy at first to try to get you to stop. He's going to throw stuff in your way. Yep. Things are going to come up and you just got to recognize it for what it is. And this is all part of the process mm -hmm. and learn to enjoy it. You know, make, make friends, 
with discomfort because you'll never be lonely, right? Exactly. Yeah, it's like that quote, I don't know who said it originally, if you're going through hell, don't stop, keep going, right? Oh. Move, right? Get out of there. Don't stop and sit in it and wallow. And I think so many people in our world today are complaining about it being hard. And we live in the easiest, like we live in the United States of America. I mean, really our life, I don't care, even if you're broke in America, you got a cush life. Right. I mean, the fact is most, the majority of our country have food to eat. They've got shelter. They've got somewhere to sleep. They've got clean water to drink. And they, for the most part, basic necessities are met for most people. And I think, unfortunately, because life is so easy for most people, they've become soft. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and that is really, if people can learn to just embrace the, suck right embrace times that hurt or struggle or and and learn to change your perspective about it and go man whatever i'm doing right now it's hard it's uncomfortable this mm -hmm. is when i'm getting better this is when i'm growing this is when i'm getting stronger i always i always try to do that whether it's like lifting weights or whatever it may be or if i'm running i just think i always just try to change my perspective man it this right now this hurt is is the growth i've done everything up to the point to hurt Everything before that was worthless, right? Mm -hmm. The only the only benefit, the only gain I'm going to get is what I do after it hurts. And so many people are just avoiding just getting to the hurt, right? Yep. So, so Jefferson, let me ask you this. I mean, as as we wrap up, what are what are some things you'd like to get across? I mean, what's on your heart? What's on your chest? I mean, when it comes to success right now, if you, if you were talking to your son and and you know he's become a man, he just got married, he's getting ready to go out and do life on his own. What are a few things you would really want him to leave with that you think that, hey, if I give him just, you know, maybe these two or three things, if, he, if my son just left with these three things, I think he could take life and kick its ass and, you yeah. know, look back on it and go, man, I'm glad I did it. Man, I think one of the big things is intentionally do hard things. So we were just talking about it, but, but most people do anything possible to avoid the uncomfortable and the unknown and the hard in life. But you're right, man. That's where, that's where all the growth, that's where the biggest changes of trajectory in your life are going to happen is when you come into hard times. So that's, that's been something that I've been chasing is those, those biggest movements and the biggest changes of trajectory for me were always in the hardest times. And now it's, it's hard to duplicate and get that kind of, progress the further down the road that you get so early on you got to be you got to be intentional about it and you got to have patience I, I didn't have patience early on and I was always frustrated because it wasn't happening fast enough but if you're if you're consistent and you're doing hard things it will happen and it may not seem like a whole lot's happening right now in this moment but after you look back over a period of time I mean four years goes by just like that quick and I went from, you know, being in a really bad place to a lot has happened. But in each moment, like right now, it, it still feels like it's not happening fast enough. There's so much that I know that I still need to do and I still want to do and I still need to become. And it just doesn't ever seem like it's happening fast enough. But I know it's happening because every single day I'm more disciplined and more consistent with these behaviors and the habits than I've ever been before. Right. So the, your daily habits pay attention to your daily habits, audit your time, cut out all the negativity and just focus on doing whatever is the most productive thing at every given moment of your day. And you got to enjoy it right now. I'm, I'm trying to enjoy working my ass off, right? Because this is the season for me while I have a ton of momentum and I still got this hunger to just keep pushing. And I'm trying to enjoy the process while I'm still this hungry. I can tell you are enjoying it, actually. I can just tell. I can feel it. I mean, it's you're enjoying it. I Not, love it, man. You, there, I mean, there, there's always crap you got to do you don't want to do. But, you know, you, you have a good attitude about it. You go, this is part of the deal. Most people aren't yep. willing to do this. Look I at signed up for this. Yeah. I signed up for it, so I got to deal with it. Yeah, you get to. And, like, look, look at the result of it, right? Look at what's happened to your life. Right, and these little struggles or challenges that we put yeah. up. I mean, I, I think that's another reason we forget them. Because in proportion to the amount of how great our life is compared to how small these struggles become when we look back on them, right? We go, mm -hmm. wow, 
I don't, I don't need to remember that. Right? No. <laughs> this, this is so good. I'll do it a hundred times over. Right. Yeah. We don't so, have to do anything, right? We no, get to, and yeah, what a great attitude. To. I don't have to go work out tomorrow. I get to go work out. I don't yeah. have to go to work today. I get to go to work today. We're in the United States of America for crying out loud. Yep. You know, let's go let it rip. Yep. Exactly. I'm with you. Yeah. Well, that's awesome, man. I'm so proud of you, dude, and what you're building, and and I'm excited for your future. And I know your family's gonna watch this, and they're proud of you too. And and uh, it's awesome to see, dude. Thank you so much for you guys. coming on here thank today. You. I know you're gonna impact yes, thank a lot you. of people, man. So appreciate it. Very yeah, good that's today. The plan. Yeah, awesome. Let's get on some hunts too. Let's do it. A couple it. years. You're 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 on your game right now. I don't yeah. want, I don't want to distract you. Yeah, I've got I got enough distractions, but I can I can usually make room for a hunt here okay. every now and then. All right. Yeah, we need to go shoot something. Baby. Let's go to Mexico. I'm going to go to Mexico. I'll come. come. Well, Let's you, do you it. Both, I need a freezer full of. October. I need a freezer full. Problem of Problem is you can't bring the meat back. Oh. The FDA won't let it come back from Mexico. Dang. It's a bad part, but they're big bulls. You can hang well, it on we'll the just, wall. We'll just you guys want to go, man? We'll, we'll just give it the meat to someone else. Let them bring it across, right? Yeah, yeah. Hey, yeah. I don't know. I don't know if I would trust they that. They smuggle all kinds of stuff across that border. <laughs> I know. I mean, Why not? Well, elk I'm meat? sure we can get some help. <laughs> <laughs> well, you guys probably get away with it. You guys, yeah, you guys, yeah, are pretty yeah. good at that kind of stuff. <laughs> That's so funny. I, th- I, th- I think we you, like bending the rules a little yeah. bit. I, I think when one time when we were young, you came across the border one night, didn't you? I did. <laughs> yep. We <laughs> went. Uh, I didn't get to go on a senior trip. With my class, wait. In do you want to admit this on a public forum? Oh yeah, it's this is <laughs> man. <laughs> I, cool. I used to not be able to talk openly about a lot of the mistakes and the experiences because they were. I was like a shameful thing in my life, but they're fun to talk about now. <laughs> but yeah, we were we were drinking in Mexico in Tijuana. This is one of the craziest, nastiest places that I've ever been in my life. And we were at this this bar where they serve you buckets of beer, and we weren't there for very long, but. I got so drunk at that place. And they had this, was it a clown? Was it a big clown that was in the entrance? I can't even remember. But I, we were leaving, and I was tripping all over everybody, and I knocked over like this big display at the, at the very front of the bar. And I got tackled by the security guards, and these guys were like, oh, he's going to jail. So they, they got out of there so they wouldn't get in trouble. And they took my license, and they were questioning me. And I grabbed my license out of one of the, the security guard's hands, and I went flying down the stairs and like, like slid down the stairs and went running out into the street. And I didn't see the guy, so I just kept running. And then there's no cell service, and we had like our Nokia phones that didn't work. And so yeah. these guys thought they lost me in Tijuana, and I was going to like end up in a gutter somewhere. Yeah, we left him there, dude. We got back to the hotel room, and he beat us home. <laughs> <laughs> you, got, you got home before they did. Yeah, we're like, what the heck? How did he end up? You know, it's crazy. So, yeah, I, I tried to find them for a little bit, and then I, I just walked out to the parking lot and met up with these girls that were coming out of the out of the border and said, hey, you guys uh, aren't happen to drive by Oceanside, are you? Because I, I, dri- <laughs> I need a ride. Yeah. Oh, that's you get creative, so man. You get creative yep. when you got to get creative. That's, yeah. that's one thing that you I've survived. always been is resourceful. Yeah. Been, yeah. That's impressive. Yeah, I think being resourceful is a key to becoming successful, right? It's mm-hmm. not it's not what you have, it's using what you've got, all right, and becoming resourceful yep. with it. So yeah. I think maybe we can get an elk across the border, dude. Yeah, yeah I think you might be able to. See if I found myself <laughs> well, first of all, I would never find myself in a position like that. True. We know that. We know <laughs> you, you wouldn't have been in that position. You're right. <laughs> we know this. Uh, which is probably good because I would die. Yeah, that's probably a good maybe. situation. Yeah. 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 That's yeah. Pro- Probably there was no question in my mind I was going to make it out of there. <laughs> you were you were fine. Yeah. Just yeah. an adventure. It was a, it was a cool adventure. Yeah. Now it's just a fun story to tell. Right. You know? Hey. But there if you don't do anything crazy, dude, you don't have any fun stories. Tell my wife that. Let's see what she thinks. Uh, I say. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's well, Jeff told me and have kids. It's a different Lex, kind of Jeff crazy. Jeff told me I gotta do crazy stuff. Yeah, just just a little bit. Like I mean, you could change now. You can do like you know you can go skydiving. I mean, that's a little yeah, crazy. Right. You know, right. you can do. You, you don't have to like run from Mexican cops you don't have across to break, the you don't border. Have to break the law. Yeah, you don't have to break the law. You can just yeah. you know do some adrenaline stuff. Right. You know, like we went race these cars in Vegas the other day. Yeah, that was awesome. Yeah, you know you yeah. can drive a Got some serious back. adrenaline. You were number one, right? Yeah, dude, you won. That the whole for the whole day. That's it was a, crazy. That's amazing. And he he awesome. beat the next guy by like two seconds. Four. This is, wow. Yeah. It was not. Or a, maybe it was just two seconds. Yeah, but you beat me by four. Do seconds. You have a oh pass? yeah, you. That's right. That's right. Was Kelsey a passenger? Or just no, you? they they 
there's like a instructor that okay. sits next to you. Okay, just in case you get a little bit too crazy, they can shut it down. Yeah. No, they can't shut it down. They got no brake pedal. There's no governor, no brake, no huh. nothing. They huh. give you the keys to an exotic car. It, well, and what was cool about it is, you know, I've owned exotic cars, but you'll drive these cars. You would never drive your own car like you would drive that mm-hmm. car. So right. it's a cool experience. Even if you owned the car, there's no way you would drive it like yeah. that. I was completely sending it. And my car wasn't nearly as fast as Jeff. So, and these things are all wheel drive and they stick to the ground. It's and not the car, it's the driver. Have you not seen Top Gun 2 yet? Yes, I have. I'm, I'm teasing. Incredible, incredible movie. <laughs> it is a great but that movie. But was, that was some serious adrenaline down that long straightaway, hitting like 140 miles an hour. Flying. I highly recommend. Cool. Going yeah, and racing go, exotic cars. I gotta go do it. It's only, in Las an, Vegas. only an hour away. Yep. Yeah, it's close and it's totally worth it. Well, awesome. cool. Well, thank you, gentlemen, for being on today. And appreciate what you a, guys. What a great podcast on great developing podcast. great men. Yeah, thank you very winning. much. Thanks, guys. Yeah, you bet.